this lecture we are going to characterize convex functions by characterize we mean we will find certain properties of the derivative of the function we will evaluate the gradient and hessian of a given function and we will check if certain conditions are satisfied then satisfying them the function certainly is going to be a convex function well on the last day if we recollect then uh, we will find from our class note that in the last day we have discussed about continuity of a given convex function we have seen the following result that if a function f is convex on a given open convex set then the function must be continuous in that open convex set in particular if we consider a function f on a given convex set which is not necessarily open then the function must be continuous in the interior of the given convex set let's suppose capital x we have also seen the local lipschitz property of a convex function we have also observed the following interesting fact the existence of directional derivative that if a given point x bar which is known to be interior of the domain of the definition of the given convex function then along every possible direction emanated from the given point x bar the function the convex function must have a directional derivative that we have seen and towards the end of the class we were trying to discuss about the zeroth order characterization by zeroth order characterization we mean we involved only the function values or its graph to characterize convexity of the function we have seen uh, two particular results on the zeroth order characterization of convexity the first one was if a function is having the following property that it is convex along every possible direction emanated from any point x bar in the domain of the definition of the given function then the function itself is a convex function we have also seen an epigraphic characterization of a given function we have seen that a function f is convex if and only if the function is having epigraph a convex set that we have seen and we ended the class in today's class we will start with first order characterization where we will involve the information of the gradient or the information of the partial derivatives of the given function to characterize the convexity of the function we will particularly observe two particular results where at first we will try to see in the first result a global bound for the entire convex function is nothing but any tangent on the graph of the function and another one is if a function f is known to be convex vice versa result this is true that its gradient is monotonic its derivative is monotonic function that we shall see so these two characterization will be known to us as first order characterization of convexity then we will observe an widely applied result to identify convexity of a given function is the use of the hessian provided the function f is twice continuously differentiable we shall see that a function which is known to be twice continuously differentiable is convex if and only if its hessian is positive semi definite well so let's start our class with the first order characterization in which as i have mentioned we will try to discuss two particular results towards this for the first order characterization let us start with the following result it says that let s be a non empty subset of the n dimensional euclidean space and it is also convex and f be a function that is defined on the given convex set then this function f is convex if and only if fy is greater than equal to fx plus gradient at x 
x times y minus x happens to be true for every x y belonging to the set S provided the set be non empty and open. If it is not open, then the function may not be continuous and hence the existence of gradient of f is questionable. That's why we require openness of the domain of the definition capital S. Now to prove the result, we follow the following steps. Proof is followed from the construction of directional derivative of the given function. How do we prove it? Let us start the proof as follows. For the necessity of the result, we start with, let's suppose the function f be convex. And if f is convex, then for any, any pair of points x, y belonging to s, and any alpha in between open 0 to 1 due to convexity of the function we have f of alpha y plus 1 minus alpha x is less than equal to alpha times f y plus 1 minus alpha times f x. This is true for every pair of points x and y. Hence, hence we note that you have then on the left hand side x plus alpha times the direction y minus x less than equals to you have fx plus alpha times fy minus fx. As alpha is a positive quantity you have 1 by alpha times f of x plus alpha times y minus x minus fx is less than equal to fy minus fx. This is true for every alpha in between 0 to 1. Now if we take now taking limit alpha tends to 0 or 0 plus you have on the left hand side we note that this is nothing but the directional derivative of the function f at the point x along the direction d which is y minus x and accordingly as the function f is okay I had to assume that the function f is differentiable otherwise directional derivative may not exist is differentiable. I am very sorry as we are moving with first order factorization and therefore differentiability assumption is mandatory here and accordingly as the function f is known to be differentiable it has directional derivative and the directional derivative is given by gradient of f at the point x transpose the direction y minus x which is less than equals to f y minus f x and hence the forward part of the result follows. Now for the reverse part, for the reverse part let us assume that this inequality happens to be true. Let us suppose this inequality that f y minus f x is greater than equals to gradient of f x transpose y minus x happens to be true for every pair of points x and y and then we need to prove the convexity of the function. And to prove the convexity of the function, let us pick a pair of point x1, x2 belonging to S and also we do take a lambda or an alpha in between 0 and 1. And then what do we have to prove? We have to prove the defining inequality for the convexity that f of alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 is less than equals to alpha times fx1 plus 1 minus alpha times fx2 that we require to prove. How do we prove it? For this let us construct the following two steps. We note that as the function um, is following this particular inequality accordingly we note that if we consider the point in the argument that we require at alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2, let us denote it by 
sum x cap or let's suppose x itself fine or let me put x alpha here so that it is you know, although it is a generic point but still it is involving alpha and it is in between x1 and x2 so with this we construct the following two steps note that we have according to the given condition that fx1 is greater than fx if we consider the pair of points x1 and x then we have we have this and we also have for the pair of points x and x2 we have a x2 greater than equals to fx plus gradient of f x transpose x2 minus x fine now multiplying the first inequality by alpha and second inequality by 1 minus alpha as both the quantities alpha and 1 minus alpha are positive quantity therefore therefore if we multiply respectively these two inequalities by alpha 1 minus alpha then add them up what we will have is the following alpha f x1 plus 1 minus alpha f x2 is greater than equals to fx plus gradient of f x transpose alpha times x1 minus alpha times x plus 1 minus alpha times x2 minus 1 minus alpha times x fine on the right hand side you have fx plus gradient of fx transpose you note that here you have alpha times x uh, positive alpha times x and you have negative alpha times x and they will get cancelled out and accordingly you will have alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 minus x and which is nothing but this vector due to our construction that x is equal to the convex combination alpha x1 plus 1 minus alpha x2 you have this vector to be 0 fine and accordingly this is equal to a f sorry i have given here the notation x alpha so i should carry away it here or rather let us forget it let us eventually remove this alpha from here and accordingly the result is followed we note that this inequality is uh, true that the inequality that we have proved this is true for every x1 and x2 and also for any alpha there is no restriction taken for x1 x2 and alpha and therefore the requirement inequality required inequality for the convexity is followed over here and hence the function f is convex the result is proved now but uh, there are lot many things from this result which can be noted very important to note the following let me put as numbered notes so the first note that I would like to mention is the immediate one that the note one the first note is that we note that you have this inequality that f y is greater than equals to f x plus gradient of f x transpose y minus x what does this inequality mean and this is true for every pair of points x y inside the set s according to the theorem according to the theorem if the function f is convex if f is convex then f is convex on s which is known to be non-empty open non-empty open as well as convex the hypothesis in the theorem uh, if this is true then you have this right and what does this result says very interesting to note that on the right hand side that you have is the linear approximation of the function 
that denotes first order approximation or the linear approximation of the function f at the point x and this is nothing but the equation z equals to this expression this is nothing but the tangent line or the tangent plane or the tangent hyperplane if we have the graph of the function to have a vivid idea about how what is going on over here let's suppose you have the graph of the function this which is a convex function y equals to fx and what does the result says the result says that you pick up any point let's suppose i pick up a point x here and afterwards what is happening let me fix x or rather let me fix x bar and accordingly what you have is for every for every y you have f y is greater than equals to f x bar plus gradient of f x bar transpose y minus x bar and this is true for every y in s in the domain of the definition capital s and this is what this inequality says that on the right hand side as it is a equation of the equation of the tangent so you draw the tangent of the to the function at the point x bar and this is the tangent line here this is given by y equals to f of x bar plus as i have drawn function of one variable's graph therefore it will be just the derivative f dash x bar times x minus x bar fine and what does this inequality says that and from the graph itself also it is vivid that the entire graph entire graph of the function y equals to fx is lying above the tangent line y equals to fx bar plus f dash x bar times x minus x bar so this is not only true for only at the point x bar but also any other points you take any other point if i vary the point x bar to some other point let's suppose i do take this point as my x bar then accordingly what will happen you draw the tangent to the function and that tangent we know that the entire graph is lying above the tangent line so here not only the graph y equals to fx is lying above the tangent line but also this line touches the surface of y equals to fx the graph of the function and these such lines are called as supporting hyperplane as if the entire graph is supported on this hyperplane that means it is just touching the hyperplane and it is above the entire line these are called as supporting hyperplanes as if they are um, the graphs are supported by in the below um, you have a support and that support surface is the tangent tangent plane tangent hyperplane or the tangent line according to how many variables you have for the function f now here therefore what we have is we note that if you just know somehow the function's value at the point x bar and if you know the gradient value of the function and then you take a linear approximation of the function with the help of fx bar and gradient of uh, fx bar then this line is a lower bound by lower bound i mean the entire graph lies above this tangent and this is the fact that is true not only for only one tangent not only true for only one point but also at any point you consider the function lies above the tangent line fine and these estimates now these tangent lines then can be thought of they are lower estimate of the entire graph the function's value can never below the tangent line so this can be thought of all these tangent lines are lower estimates and not only a lo in a local neighborhood but also these estimates these tangent lines are global estimates by global estimates i mean you take any point in the domain of the definition the function value is higher than the tangent line so any tangent line any tangent plane or tangent hyperplane to the surface of a convex function is a global lower estimate of the given function this is what important fact we can observe but we note that much more important thing 
we consider only a local information that means we consider only as you know derivative information is a local information at a point it gives the instantaneous rate of change of the function accordingly gradient of f obviously at x bar gives a local information of the function how much rapidly how rapidly the function changes that is that is hidden into the information or the numeric value of the gradient and accordingly you take a local information and you are getting a global lower bound and therefore a local information gives us a global lower bound or global information for the graph of the function this is what the important thing that i wanted to mention you over here so a local information gives a global estimator let me just also write down here as this is very important fact in convex analysis uh, let me write completely local information gives global lower estimate lower estimate or you can also say underestimate underestimate of the function values by lower estimates i mean the function values at any point in the domain of the definition can never become below the function value at the tangent fine well so with this let me move ahead to the next result the next result or uh, before that let me also say um, here i was thinking to give you the following information when uh, i will be um, introducing local and global minimum let me also give here so that later on again i don't have to recall this result note two is that if gradient of f x bar is equal to 0 for a convex function convex function f defined on s to r then then what will happen we note that if gradient of fx bar is equal to 0 then from the inequality that fx is greater than equals to fx bar plus gradient of fx bar transpose x minus x bar and this is true for every x belonging to s provided here again i have to mention that this s is non empty open and convex subset of rn fine as gradient is equal to 0 therefore you have here is equal to fx bar for all x belonging to s if this is true that fx bar is always below than any other function values function values at any other point x in s then this eventually implies this eventually implies x bar is a global minimum global minimum of the function f on Yes, and therefore we note that if you somehow came to know that x bar is a point at which the gradient value is equal to zero, the derivative value is equal to zero, that particular point must be a global minimum of the function. Obviously, provided the function f is convex. If the function f is not convex, this result might not be true. Anyway, so now next uh, result that I would like to mention here for the first order characterization of convexity is the following. Result two, which is in fact a derivation from the result one, which is again a first order characterization, but also let me name it as amount on increasing gradient. Why is it? This will be revealed from the inequality that I will be stating in this result. this result says that again under the same hypothesis that uh, the set s is a non empty
open convex set open and convex subset of Rn and if defined on S V A continuously differentiable we also do not require continuously differentiable uh, with differentiability is it enough V A differentiable function because we are not using any Taylor series expansion here differentiable function differentiable convex function okay convexity will be in the condition if and only condition differential function on s then then f is convex f is convex on the set s if and only if for any pair of points for any pair of points x1 x2 belonging to s gradient difference gradient fx1 minus gradient fx2 transpose x1 minus x2 is greater than or equal to 0 right there is a just a little manipulation with the result one the proof is followed from a simple manipulation from the result one due to shortage of time i am just skipping this proof interested ones can visit the book by bazara sarali satis third edition book page number triple one fine and let me let me recollect what this result is eventually saying rather so this result says the following we note that if it is a function of one variable then what does this result says this result says the following that um, the derivative of the function f at the point x1 for function of one variable note here for function of one variable what does this result says the result says that you have f dash x1 minus f dash x2 if it is a function of one variable times x1 minus x2 is greater than or equals to 0 for every pair of points x1 x2 belonging to s that is what this result says right and if this is true for every pair of points then the function f is convex now what does this this inequality says this inequality says the following that if we have x1 greater than x2 then obviously we note that f dash x1 is greater than f dash x2 because multiplication of these two quantities is a non-negative quantity therefore if this is non-negative obviously the first factor is also non-negative and vice versa that if it is if it is non-negative then this is also non-negative or also we have if this is negative x1 is less than x2 then also we have f dash x1 less than f dash x2 and accordingly what happens this eventually implies that the fun function f dash is monotonically increasing on the set s this is this can be quickly revealed from the graph uh, graphical perspective as well now let me just draw out a function of one variable a convex function then let me recollect from there itself from the graph itself why this is going to happen you note that if um, the functions graph on the given set s is the following that let me graph out a function like this here you have y equals to fx let me consider uh, two points x1 let's suppose i have a point x1 here i have a point x2 here then we note that the derivative value of the function at this point and at this point they eventually give the slope of the tangent line when if we draw let me draw with two different colors this is my tangent line for x1 and for x2 my tangent line is this one fine now we note that the slope of the function at at the point x1 is the tangent of the angle theta 1 
and the slope of the um, of the tangent at the point x2 is the tangent of the angle theta2 we note that you have theta1 less than theta2 and accordingly as here in the graph you have here 0 less than theta1 less than pi by 2 less than theta2 less than pi by 2 and from here we note that as tangent is an increasing function you have tan theta1 is less than tan theta2 and this is precisely the same thing that we are observing that f dash is increasing f dash is increasing means tan theta is increasing right the slope is increasing and therefore if a function f is having increasing slope increasing slope function if f dash is increasing on the entire convex function open convex set s then the function f must be convex and in higher dimension instead of this f dash you will have gradient gradient is a monotone increasing function on the given set s fine by monotone increasing of here you note that uh, this gradient of f is a vector valued function it is unlike a real valued function f dash and for vector valued function by monotone increasing we mean that you have this inequality that gradient of fx minus gradient of f y transpose times x minus y is greater than equals to 0 by this we mean the notion of monotonicity monotony increasingness fine well so this was a note that i wanted to mention here that uh, if the slope of the function is monotone increasing then the function must be convex in nature and um, uh, from this result itself you can now think what can be a second order condition to check the convexity if f dash is increasing and uh, obviously if you know that f double dash exists then obviously you will say f double dash x must be greater than equals to zero for a convex function precisely that is the result in the second order condition to check the convexity that a function f is convex if and only if the hessian matrix is positive semi definite if double dash x greater than equals to zero for multivariable function is nothing but the hessian matrix is positive semi definite let me state the result and as the second order condition is widely used in optimization theory development as well as numerical aspects therefore uh, let me prove the second order condition let me at first state and then prove the second order characterization of convexity let again we consider a set capital s is b a non empty open and convex subset of R n fine and also we let that f is twice continuously differentiable then f is convex if and only if the hessian matrix at any point of the domain of the definition is positive semi definite on s let us try to prove this result we at first prove the forward part and then the reverse part will be proved in the forward part it is given that the function f is convex f is convex on s it is given if f is convex then we will have certain inequalities that the first order condition it is true but what do we what do we require to prove f is given to be convex and we require to prove that for any vector p in the n-dimensional Euclidean space you have p transpose f x bar p is greater than equals to 0 for any p in Rn and this has to happen for every x bar inside the set S fine now how do we prove it 
Here note that um, there can be two possible cases either p is a null vector or a non null vector. If it is null vector, then it is trivially greater than equals to 0 because it will be just equal to 0. And if it is non null vector, then let me try to prove it. Now let p is not a null vector. Fine. Now here you note that we are trying to prove we are focusing only on the point x bar and there was no restriction taken on x bar except that x bar is an element on s as x bar is an element on s and s is given to v open therefore what will happen as the set s is given to be convex open set you have a convex open set over here let's suppose this is the convex open set this is your set s open convex set it is and here was your point let's suppose x bar fine as x bar is a point of the open set S, therefore x bar is an interior point and therefore there is an open ball which is lying entirely inside the set S, right? Of radius, let's suppose, of radius delta, fine? And you have a ball of radius delta, open ball of radius delta centering at x bar and which is lying entirely inside the set S. This is due to the fact that X bar is an interior point. Fine. If this is true, then obviously we note that from here you can find that uh, if we move along the direction P, let's suppose the direction of P is um, some direction. Let's suppose this is my direction of P. Fine. Here was let's suppose origin and here was your direction P and here then emanated from x bar the direction of p is along this direction right and we note that as x bar is an interior point therefore there must exist an amount of length delta such that for all length for all the points inside this much amount of length delta amount of length all the points x bar plus tp x bar plus tp is belonging to the open ball b delta x bar b subscripted delta or they are same b subscripted delta x bar or b x bar um, semicolon delta they are interchangeably used to mean the open ball centering at x bar having radius delta now here once p is non-zero vector then as x bar is an interior point there exists an amount of length say epsilon greater than zero such that for all modulus of t less than epsilon this epsilon is precisely this much length that delta divided by norm of p fine now with this epsilon we note that for all t in between minus epsilon to plus epsilon this x bar plus tp is inside the ball open ball b delta x bar and this b delta x bar is a subset of the set s fine now if this is true then we will apply now the first order condition at the point x bar plus tp we note that if we take two pair of point a pair of points x bar plus tp and x bar then you have x bar plus tp function value at x bar plus tp is greater than equals to fx bar plus gradient of fx bar transpose x bar plus tp minus x bar so it will be just t into p fine and this happens to be true for all t less than epsilon fine and accordingly you have the following as the function f is known to be twice differentiable and therefore here we consider to approximate the function uh, not approximate the function Taylor, Taylor's expansion of second order uh, for the function f at x bar will give us fx bar plus tp transpose gradient of f x bar plus tp transpose hcn at the point x bar into 
Tp plus small o of norm of T, right? Norm of T, fine. And this is greater than equals to this is greater than equals to fx bar plus gradient of fx bar transpose tp which is for every t satisfying mod t less than epsilon fine now this gives us t square p transpose hessian at x bar p plus small o as norm b is a constant thing and therefore you have it is just small o of t square sorry i have missed here a square because it is second order approximation therefore you have a square here small o of t square is greater than equals to zero for all t in between minus epsilon to plus epsilon right so if t is not equal to zero for t not equal to zero you have p transpose hessian at x bar p plus small o of t square divided by t square greater than equals to zero for all modulus t less than epsilon with obviously t not equals to zero fine and then from here the result is followed that if we now take as this result is true for every t in the neighborhood of zero and therefore by taking by taking t tends to zero you have on the left hand side p transpose hessian p is greater than equals to zero because this is small o of t square and therefore by the definition of small o this tends to zero and this is greater than equals to zero and therefore due to arbitrariness of the choice of p as well as of the choice of x bar you have gradient hessian of the function f at any point x in the set s is positive semi definite let me consider to prove the reverse part now for the reverse part it is given that the hessian matrix is positive semi definite at each point in s now what we have to prove we have to prove the convexity of the function f now to prove the convexity we consider a pair of points consider two points x and x bar two points in s so we will not prove here um, with lambda the inequality the defining defining inequality of convexity but we will prove the first order factorization that will be easier and uh, this and we require to prove is required to prove that f x is greater than equals to f x bar plus gradient transpose x minus x bar for all x x bar inside s fine and this part is this for all is due to the arbitrariness of the choice this will be followed so we just only have to prove this inequality for the consider two points x and x bar as there was no restriction taken on x and x bar except that they are element of s therefore this inequality once proved it will follow the convexity due to the first order factorization of convexity right now how do we prove this fact this can be proved in the following manner that once two points x and x bar is given in s then there is a mean value theorem for function of two or more variables by mean value theorem mean value theorem there exists an x cap and we note that this x cap is lying in the line segment joining x and joining x and x bar and therefore there exists an x cap which can be presented by lambda times x bar plus 1 minus lambda times x for some some lambda in between 0 and 1 here we note that this x cap can be presented by this convex combination 
so for some lambda in between 0 and 1 x cup can be presented by the convex combination of x bar and x fine and by mean value theorem there for some lambda in between 0 and 1 such that you have f of x is equal to f of x bar plus gradient of f x bar transpose x minus x bar plus half of x minus x bar gradient of here you note that we have x1 minus x2 square or x minus x bar square but for function of several variables it will be the quadratic form x minus x bar transpose then function value at the point x cap times x minus x bar fine this is what the mean value theorem for function of several variables fine now from here the result is followed as you have assumed that that the hessian is positive semi definite therefore this quantity is obviously greater than or equals to 0 fine and once this is greater than or equals to 0 you have this is greater than or equals to f of x bar plus gradient of f of x bar transpose x minus x bar and that is your first order characterization of convexity and hence the result is followed that the function f is convex fine now here again I need to put a few important notes from this result. So the first note is if the set S is not open, the result might not be valid. That means you may have the function f is convex on S but the Hessian might not be positive, semi-definite but still the function f is convex. So here let me give you an instance for instance take the function a function of two variables x1 x2 given by x1 square minus x2 square and you take capital S as the x2 axis of the R2 plane that means I take x1 and 0 x1 is a real number fine here you note that on this capital s the function f is a convex function because that is x1 square and therefore the function f is convex however its hessian hessian of f on s is given by is eventually not only on s it is everywhere in R2 plane its hessian is a constant matrix which is not dependent on x1 and x2 the constant matrix is given by you can quickly calculate 2 0 0 minus 2 which is indefinite which is not positive semi definite on s fine and therefore the forward part of the result that the function f is convex implies the hessian is positive semi definite is not true if you consider is non open set may not be true it may be open for some example but in general it is not true now for next note i put the following that here we if from the result you can you can just get that the raise the reverse part is not requiring any openness that means hessian is positive semi definite and afterwards the proof um, that does not require any openness however forward part requires openness because once x bar is inside the set capital s then you have an open ball then the construction of t in between minus epsilon to plus epsilon they might not be followed if the set capital s is not open However, the reverse part of the result is true even if S is not an open set. And not only that, not only positive semi-definiteness of the Hessian implies convexity, but also if we have that a further strengthened result, if the Hessian is positive definite, Hessian is positive definite 
on a convex set, not necessarily open, but obviously we are assuming it is non-empty, a non-empty convex subset, non-empty convex subset of the entire n-dimensional Euclidean space, non-empty convex S, and then, then the function f is strictly convex. It's fine. And for the proof, you can just follow the proof of the reverse part of the previous result. Here you will have a strict inequality. Here we know that you will have just a, here a strict inequality. And if you have strict inequality, then you follow the proof of the reverse part of the first order characterization of convexity. Then that will give you strictness. And however, converse of this result is not true. That if is strictly convex might not imply that the Hessian is positive definite. For example, for example, you can just quickly take for example, for example, take fx a function of one variable fx equals to x to the power 4. Can anyone prove that fx equals to x to the power 4 is a strictly convex function? Can you be able to prove it? Check it on your own. I am giving a home task here. That take this which is strictly convex, but this although this function is strictly convex, but what we have is the derivative value, second derivative value is not always greater than 0. Although this is a strictly convex function, from the graph, you can quickly identify why it is, but mathematically, can you be able to prove it? Because this course is really going to be mathematical. Uh, for every construction and everything, you should have a mathematical expression to explain the thing. It is not that by, by just a simple geometry, you just feel it and then after the feeling, you just conclude. That is not valid thing in mathematical writing. And therefore, here you need to prove that really it is strictly convex by proving the inequality uh, of def uh, defining inequality of strict convexity. Fine. Can you be able to prove it? I am putting is a, putting this as a home task. Try to uh, check it out. If you don't get, then you drop an email. I will try to help you out. No issue. Now, although f is strictly convex function on the entire R, but we note that in the entire R, you do not have positivity of the second order derivative of the function. And therefore, the converse of the result stated in note 2 might not be true. Fine. Now, well, so here time is uh, moving off. Anyway, so let me stop here then. On the next class, I will continue with a few convexity preserving operations those operations um, are such that for a pair of convex functions if those operations are applied not only a pair of convex functions but also if we have a collection of convex functions finitely many and after that if we apply those operations on those finitely many combination of convex functions collection of convex functions then the output by those operations applied on the collection of convex functions is also a convex function. For instance, let me put you a question here. Let's suppose I have I have a pair of functions. Let's suppose I have f1 and f2. Is it true that f1 minus f2 is a convex function? Is it true that their addition f1 plus f2 is convex? Is it true that their product is convex? Is it true? that their composition is convex. Try to hang a little on these questions. Or also, is it true that their de division f1 by f2 is convex, provided f2 is non-zero um, throughout the domain of the function f2. Now, are they convex? If, now let me, let me end up the class by putting this question before you. Let f1 and f2 be convex functions convex functions. Now, are the functions convex 
formulas what do you think about that well and afterwards uh, you will obviously you will see that some of them are convex some of them are not now try to identify which are really convex and which are not and why not if not then give uh, some counter examples and uh, on the next day then we will continue um, to have answers for these questions and afterwards we will mention general a few operations once those are applied on a pair of convex functions or uh, for a collection of convex functions then um, once applied then uh, um, are those output by the operations be convex so that will be the question that will be answered in the next class so our next class we will start with convexity preserving operations and once this is finished then we will move forward to find necessary and sufficient optimality condition necessary and sufficient condition for optimality for unconstrained optimization those are the agenda in the next class well let me stop here thank you thank you all for your kind presence